Hey guys, it's Libby, and today I'm doing a small haul. Um, I don't buy books very often, um, and I don't think I'm going to be buying any more until uh, Christmas. So this, I figured I should haul these books now so I can like put them on my shelves. Um, but before we get to books, I have a non-book. I have a bard. This is um, a Christmas present from several years ago. Uh, it's a stuffed Shakespeare from the Unemployed Philosophers Guild. Whenever my family doesn't know what to get me for Christmas, they just go to the Unemployed Philosophers Guild um, and get me something from there. So he is going to go right up there in the Bard Shrine, which is diversifying from just my Yale edition. So now I've got the Bard himself as well as my, um, what are these, my critical Shakespeare things. I've got Shakespeare and Muriel Garber's Shakespeare After All. But moving on to the actual books, the first one I have here is The Dubliners by James Joyce. Um, I picked this up um, when I was at my cousin's wedding in Salt Lake City at a used bookstore. I feel like this is the right place to start with James Joyce. You're supposed to do this, then Portrait of the Artist, then Ulysses, then Finnegan's Wake, with the hope of actually being able to comprehend Finnegan's Wake by the time you get to it. Now, I think of myself as being all the way on the James Joyce side of a spectrum uh, where the other side is occupied by George Orwell. Um, George Orwell seems to be very interested in the communicative aspect of language, of most clearly taking what is in my head and putting it into your head. However, James Joyce and I have accepted that this is just fundamentally impossible, that language is a weak and paltry thing in comparison with the universe of thought. Did you guys expect a philosophy of language lesson inside of a a book haul? I bet you did not. Welcome to my channel. Um, so James Joyce and I have just sort of abandoned the need for clear communication and we're going more for self-expression. We're trying to use sort of different angles to present our thoughts to the world and if they are communicated then that's great but if they're not then they weren't going to be anyway because of the weakness of language. So if we need to borrow a word from a different language, make up a word, break the rules of grammar in order to most accurately depict what is in our minds, we can do it. But I don't think that Dubliners reflects that full, fully formed expression regardless of communication. So we shouldn't have any difficulty reading the first sentence. Uh, this is from the sisters. I'm just gonna read the first sentence of the first story. There was no hope for him this time. It was the third stroke. Hmm. I wonder if that means stroke of the clock or stroke of the brain. The next one I have is Plain Song by Kent Haruf. I picked this one up in the Jackson City Airport in Wyoming. So uh, after the wedding in Salt Lake City, uh, I went up to Wyoming um, and filmed that video while I was walking around the Grand Tetons. Um, sorry, the Tetons. There's only one Grand Teton. Um, and uh, in the little teeny tiny airport in Jackson Hole, there was um, a bookshelf full of books that the Jackson Library was getting rid of, uh, and you could just take them for free. And I was like, free books? Yes, please. Um, so I picked this one because I have already read a book by Kent Haruf, and also because Kent Haruf writes very American literature, or he writes very Coloradan literature, um, and Colorado is in America. And I am such a hardcore Britlet girl, I feel like... I need to have more American lit in my life, especially when I'm in America. Um, so I picked up this, which is the first in his trilogy. Um, I've read a book that's not part of the trilogy, Our Souls at Night, um, but I think all of his stories, regardless of whether or not they're in his famous trilogy, are set in the same fictionalized Colorado town. Um, so yes, I don't really know what this is about, but should be interesting. The first sentence is, here was this man Tom Guthrie in Holt standing at the back window in the kitchen of his house smoking cigarettes and looking out over the back lot where the sun was just coming up. No punctuation. Bold move. And last in temporal acquisition, though by no means last in my heart, is possibly the most Libby book that has ever been written. 
It is Sex with Shakespeare. Here's Much to Do with Pain, but more with Love by Gillian Keenan. This is the all too rare combination of literary criticism and fetish memoir. And I am all about those things. I first encountered this book as an excerpt from the first chapter, which was posted as an article on Slate.com. Um, I will leave a link to that so you can read it to see if this is the sort of thing you want to read, because I understand you might be scared off. Um, and Gillian uh, Keenan was living in Oman when she discovered that she had a spanking fetish. She enjoyed when people hit her on the butt in a sexual way. Um, however, Oman had really strict uh, morality legislation, meaning that you could not look up porn on the internet. So she couldn't search for anything about spanking on the internet. She was not at the point where she was ready to go do this thing with other people. Um, so she read Shakespeare to see what Shakespeare had to say about this and found it very consoling. Um, so in the article on Slate, she talks about um, reading the scene from A Midsummer Night's Dream um, where Demetrius and Helena are like talking about how he doesn't like her anymore. Um, and she said that this really reminded her of a conversation that she should have had with a friend of hers, but she didn't. Um, and I, I do not agree with the conclusions that she makes about the text. I think she is often overstating her case and saying that like, this is what Shakespeare was really saying. Like Demetrius and Helena had some sort of erotic relationship before the beginning of the play that broke up. Um, and, and that's why he's now chasing Hermia. Um, but I'm really interested in like the meaning that that can bring to specific lines and you know, the meaning looking at that meaning even without the context, the, the fetish context. I've talked about this in some of my Bard Book Club videos, how like sometimes you want to put goggles on to explore a text and then keep in mind what you learned with the goggles on after you take the goggles off and see what still applies. Um, yes, so this book may in fact get me to participate in nonfiction November, if I'm not too beat up by Victober. The first sentence is, it was on my mind again. So here's the hall, this and the bard. Hello, bard. Um, yeah, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you later.